on the podcast with us today is Stephen Libman. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate you having us on. Excited to, to chat. Awesome. Well, looking forward to chatting about this 84 unit called National Road in Columbus, Ohio, that you closed back in September of 2020. And before we dive into that project, I'd like for you to give the listeners and the audience a little bit of a history and background about yourself and kind of where you are right now in, in the multifamily side of things. Sure. Uh, I graduated from Boston University in 2004. I uh, worked a corporate job in Manhattan for about 12 months before I decided that wasn't for me. I'm not real good at working for other people, as I think probably a lot of us aren't. <laughs> um, and then uh, jumped around a little bit, got into real estate on the residential side, became an agent and a broker and was working with a lot of investors, finding them some good fix and flip deals. And um, then I decided, why am I finding these guys deals? I can find them for myself. So we started flipping some houses, doing some wholesales. We built a uh, very large wholesale fix and flip business doing over 100 properties a year, um, 2016, 17, 18, and then realized that, man, this is a very highly taxed but high paying job that didn't have any tax benefits like commercial real estate investing. And it was just very transactional. We would do a deal, we'd get paid, we'd do a deal, we'd get paid. Um, but in terms of retirement and long term planning and generational wealth creation, I just did not see that as getting to me, getting us to where we really wanted to go. So, you know, all that to say that 12 year span, we learned a lot, pivoted into multifamily. Uh, we've built now about 350,000 square feet of self storage in, uh, in Florida. And we own um, a couple hundred units between uh, Columbus, Ohio, and Dallas, Texas under contract on a couple hundred more. So uh, we've acquired about $85 million of. Uh, of commercial real estate in the last 24 months or so and uh, completely pivoted our business. And now we're focusing on just continuing to find those great deals and create passive income for us and our investors and obviously take advantage of the tax benefits of it and things like that. So that's kind of the long and the short of where we've been and where we're at now. And we're looking over the next uh, three years to get to between two and 3000 more doors. That's awesome. It's a great, great to kind of see the trajectory that you're on right now and that uh, you're going to be able to grow as fast as you have. Let's go ahead and dive right into this deal without any further ado. And let's yeah. get started. And tell me a little bit about how you found and sourced this deal. Yeah. So it's relationships, right? Like everything else in life, it's uh, we bought a 66 unit, uh, what I like to call the feeder deal into a market where it wasn't necessarily my favorite deal but we needed to show the biggest broker in that market that we can uh, execute on a deal and that we would sign an LOI and complete the deal. And uh, We got the deal for uh, a good enough price on that first deal that it made sense and we, we were gonna make some good money on it. But what it really did was solidify that relationship. And we said, hey, we're gonna buy this deal, but man, we really need the next one too because we need to really create a footprint here. And uh, he agreed and we got that deal before it went to market. We were one of two offers on the table and we locked it up um, through an off market broker relationship. And how long had you had that time span been that you had been building that relationship with that broker? Well, it was about a year before he gave us the first deal. Uh, a lot of phone calls, you know, constantly checking in with them. Hey, what else you got? You know, um, so yeah, it took, it took about a year before he gave us that first deal. And then it was quick succession right after we closed that one. We got the next one in about 30 days. I want to dive into what you just said there just a little bit about uh, checking in with the broker, right? Because I think a lot of brokers get lots of phone calls from oh, people yeah. that want to acquire a project and they get this one phone call talking about what they are looking for and then they never hear from them again. Put so, me on your list. Let me see yeah. what you got. I mean, that's, and they never hear from them again at all. But I think what you just mentioned there is something that is very key and vital to what our group does as well. And being able to, you know, acquire the, the level of assets that we have is that we want to try to build a relationship with those brokers. You, we talk about investor relations, but we also need to be talking about broker relations and really create that relationship. With yeah, that, what I've learned, and I, I did sales for a long time before this job, right, is it's uh, people work with who they know, like, and trust. We've all, we all know that. We all have heard that. But how do you get somebody to know, like, and trust you? That's the big missing link here. Mm -hmm. How do you create that relationship? And, you know, I would just shoot a text like, hey, 
I saw you closed on this deal. Congratulations. Right. With like a little snide remark after it. Like, I don't think I saw this one. Right. Just out of just joking. And, yeah. you know, but we, we built the relationship with the guy and, you know, we, um, when, when we went out there to see another project, we'd ask him to come out to lunch and then we'd check in with him. Hey, how was your week on Friday? Uh, did you get anything new, anything under contract? It's really just staying in front of the broker, just like you would stay in front of a customer on a sales gig. Like you got to be, the more you're in front of somebody, the more likely it is that you'll get in front of them at the right time because timing is everything in this business. If you got something today, I don't expect him to call me today, right? I expect the guy who called him today to get that lead. And it's just how it works. So um, we learned that from our mentors and just, uh, you know, reading a ton of sales books, it's, uh, it's touches. How many times are you touching somebody and are you annoying them when you're touching them? Are you talking all about you when you're touching them? Are you finding out about them? Are you, are you calling them to find out how their kids are or to wish them a happy birthday or to congratulate them on their latest deal or to see, you know, how they did in their jujitsu tournament, whatever it is, right? It's, it's building real relationship. You can't fake that stuff. And, and people know that when they're going to send you a deal, who are they going to send it to? They're going to send it to the people that they've built the relationship with. And where you know you have really built that relationship very well is not necessarily when they give you a deal, it's off market or, or give you an opportunity. It's when they start to talk you up to the seller that you are a good buyer and that you yeah. can execute. That's that to me is really when you've really, you know, built that relationship enough with those, with, with the broker. And I'm sure you've seen it where you've been competing with five or six different offers, but you've worked with this broker before you've built a relationship and you know, it's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I like these guys because I've seen them execute. They're not going to drag you along, Mr. Seller. They're not going to, you know, kick the tires and try to renegotiate later. Like, these are the real deal buyers. They know what they're doing. They're going to come in, do due diligence, and they're going to talk to us about what they found. And it's going to be a simple, smooth process. Yep. And that's exactly right. And uh, that's one of the things that is very, you know, different about our group and a lot of other groups is, you know, that we, we don't, you know, mess around, right? Like we're, if we're going to buy a deal, we're going to buy a deal. And, right. you know, we're not gonna just going to retrade for, for, for petty things, right? Um, the only time we've ever actually retraded is, is in during the middle of the pandemic. We got a deal under contract at the beginning of uh, March of this year, of 2020. And then, uh, you know what happened in mid-March, the bottom fell out of the market. The treasury dropped, interest rates went crazy. And so we had to retrade just because the debt changed, right? Yeah. Um, but up, uh, other than that, we, we haven't tra retraded for, for small things, right? Because, you know, small things are, are not things that you want to really ruin a relationship with a seller or a broker. And yeah. it's one of the reasons why when you can, you can build that relationship with the broker and you execute with a seller, guess what? That seller is going to want to sell you another deal later on down the road. And that's I was going to say, and how many, how many of these guys own more than one deal, yeah. right? And who are they going to come back to? I mean, we've, we've built some of those relationships now where... People are saying, hey, we just closed on this one deal. By the way, I'm getting close to retirement. I have about 2,400 units that I'm going to be offloading over the next five years. And I'd like to call you guys if you're going to be interested. And we said, yeah, we would love that, right? Because we're not going to be a pain. We're not going to be a thorn, right? We, we want to help this guy get to where his goals are, which is retirement. And in the process, find more deals and get more deal flow. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's an important aspect of the business that I think a lot of gurus don't really teach. It's like, Hey, this is, this is relationship one-on-one. Don't, yep. <laughs> don't be a pain in somebody's neck and execute when you say you're going to execute. So you said on this particular property, there were two offers. Is that correct? Yeah. So we had two offers, uh, I believe on this deal and you know, same thing we got under contract on it in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, so it was a bridge loan. So that was, uh, as you know, bridge debt kind of went away for a couple months and then it did come back. Thank God. Um, cause during that time frame, we renegotiated with the seller. Now he was going to do seller back financing. Um, and then he didn't want to do seller back financing. It was just this back and forth, back and forth. We were under contract on this deal for man, probably six, seven months. Um, trying to figure it out through the pandemic. And he, he held with us. He was a, you know, he, this was the only asset he owned. He was old school guy. He would literally go bang on doors to collect rent every month. And it had, um, let's see, there was 84 units. There's 28 down units. So the whole basement was basically gutted. So we had 28 units that were not income producing. And so uh, that's why we needed the bridge. Um, Towards the end, uh, what was it about August? We, July, August, we found a bank uh, 
that was doing bridge debt and we got fantastic terms better than what we underwrote in the first place because i think somebody saw a gap in the market and they came in and uh, it was partial recourse which was a little bit different for us but you know it was a total loan of you know let's say 82 percent ltc and between 70 and 82 percent they made it recourse so it was like uh, almost a first and a second and the mm-hmm. second was the drawdown for the uh, for the bridge debt so it was new it was a new product for us um, it worked out really well. We got the, the loan done. It was a 4% loan, which was insane for bridge debt. Still is. Uh, we're still looking at debt brokers that are given 6 and 7%. But yeah, we got um, new debt, repositioned the deal, and then closed on it. So originally, when you first put this thing under contract, how many rounds and back and forth of offers did you have? Uh, it was really just submit the first offer. He came back with a counter. We accepted Okay. Okay. So it was pretty straightforward. And did you end up having to put any hard money down or anything like that? So unlike a lot of uh, groups, we have not yet had to go hard like day one. You know, we would, uh, we negotiated a 30 day due diligence, another 45 day closing. So 75 day total timeline. And we had to put um, $150,000 hard after it would go in escrow. It would go hard after the 30 day due diligence. Okay. And so what, walk me through the timeline a little bit, because obviously we know what happened with the pandemic was kind of mid-March is when things started falling apart. When did you actually get this one under contract? Yeah, it was, it was probably beginning of April or end of March, okay. right? And we were negotiating through March. Uh, he was a slow seller. Like we would send him an offer. It would take four or five days to hear back from him. Um, but then once we got it under contract, we, we, we actually did the debt with a little bit of a seller back carry. And that was a mistake on our end um, because we didn't clear it with our debt lender first. So for you guys switching from single family to multifamily, everybody thinks that seller financing is kind of a great thing to get. Well, that depends in the commercial world. It depends if it is or is not because he was going to do a seller back carry at like two and a half percent for about 800 grand. Uh, But the primary debt piece didn't allow for subordinate financing. So we said, oh, all right. So now we had to go raise that capital back out versus getting a seller back carry. Um, we asked for it, I think, just out of habit. We did it for 10 years in the, in the, in the residential space. And we said, hey, let's, let's bring that over here. That sounds like a good idea. And he was open to it. It didn't work out. That debt piece fell apart anyway. So you know, it, didn't, it wouldn't have worked because that lender stopped doing bridge debt at that time. Um, and then... And then from April to probably June or July, we were just under contract trying to figure out what was going on. His tenants were still paying hundred percent. So we didn't have any economic occupancy issues, but we had a debt piece issue and he didn't want to finance the whole thing on a seller back carry. So we just said, well, the best thing we could do is stay under contract, but wait, because we expect it to come back. We just don't know when. Um, So that's really what happened. We waited for a couple months and then we went back and we found a new debt lender that said, yeah, we, we'll do that. We'll do that deal um, based on the projections that you guys have, based on your operations, things like that. Got it under contract, uh, not under contract, but stayed under contract, got that new debt piece and then closed about 60 days later. So as you did your, for after your first 30 days, did you, did you still lock in and put the 150 down for the hard money? No, we pushed due diligence out until okay. um, to align basically with the mortgage date. Yeah. You know, so we just said, Hey, we need to extend due diligence because we're not sure what's going to happen. And he, you know, I think anybody that was reasonable in this world that was going through this with us kind of recognized that, all right, nobody knows what's going to happen. So I want to sell it. He knew that a lot of people were retrading. We were telling him, Hey, we don't even want to retrade the price. (laughs) We can't get the financing. So, you know, just hang on with us. We want the deal. We're not going to do anything. Uh, we're not going to pull our money out of escrow, but it can't go hard yet because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And he was okay yeah. with that. So each time that you extended or you basically are extending the due diligence period, okay. each time you're doing that, was there additional terms that went into place or he just kind of understood and you just kind of just rolled it every, every, you know, 30 days that you kind of extended it. You just were able to yep. extend it. No additional, you know, uh, escrow Literally. money or anything like that. 
Yeah, literally just 30 days at a clip. It was just, hey, we we're coming to the end. We still don't have anything. Do you, can you go another 30 days? And he was yeah. he was fine with it. So yeah, very um, you know, very easy seller to work with in that in that uh, in that sense. But yeah, we didn't have to renegotiate terms, put more money hard. You know, typical deals, right? You get to the end of your due diligence or you get to the closing date, you want to extend, you put another 50 grand up or whatever. Um, yeah, he knew kind of the position that he was in and we were in and we were just trying to work together to get to the common goal. So what was the the final purchase price on this one? Uh, great question. I think it was 3.1 and we're putting another 1.2 into it. 3.1 and then putting 1.2. And what's the plan for the 1.2? So that's going to go fix the 28 down units. Those are stud gutted so we have to do some new electrical plans downstairs and then finish out those 28 units mm -hmm. and then we we've spent about 300 grand outside so we've painted the buildings we've uh, done new parking lot it was a mess we've done some new fencing we've done some new like dumpster enclosures really just freshening the curb appeal up mm -hmm. it was the worst property on the best block so it was just uh it was run down. It was old. It needed to get freshened up. And, and then we'll turn the other 56 units on attrition. They're about 30% below market value. Um, so the plan was get the exterior done, get the hallways and common areas done, new LVP, uh, LED lights, you know, really make it look nice and bright, paint everything. And then get those 28 units down because we're big believers in you know, I don't want to jack the rent until we add some value. So where do they want to live? Where are they going to pay the seven fifty eight hundred dollars a month? And why would they pay that? So we did all the exterior work first. Now we're doing the 28 units to get those online. Those would be the higher rent base that's more closer to uh, market. And then the other 56 units will uh, will turn on attrition. So as those people move out and the leases come up, we'll do those turns and get those up to uh up to market as well. What's the current market rents, uh, not market rents. What's the current rents of effective rents on the property? So average is like five and a quarter. Okay. And what's the unit mix? It's mostly uh, one ones. There's 14 two ones. And uh, the 28 units, what's the story behind those being down? Yeah. So he just had some water issues in the basement. They're below grade. So a couple steps down, um, and I think there were actually hot water heaters that blew and flooded out the bottom apartments. So he removed those tenants, gutted it, and started redoing it himself. The township came in and said, hey, you don't have permits to, to do this. And uh, he was a curmudgeon guy. He was an older guy who just didn't like to be told what to do. So in lieu of getting permits, he ripped them all out and let them sit vacant for 10 years. Wow. Just collecting under market rent, it was enough. He bought the place cash. So he was cash flowing enough, I guess, to make him happy. Didn't want to get permits and drawings and go through the process the right way and just let him sit vacant. So that was the opportunity for us was, hey, we have 28 non-cash flowing units down here. You know, it's, uh, he probably left about $1.8 million on the table in terms of purchase price because he didn't get the permits on these, on these units. And how much are you spending per unit down there to get those 28 online again? It's about 15 a unit. Okay. What's the size of these units? So they're actually a little bit bigger than market. Uh, the two bedrooms are about 950 and the one bedroom is about 800. Okay. Seems pretty low, 15,000 a unit for... <laughs> to be able to get those from a stud format <laughs> to be able to get them online. Yeah, I think that's right. I can check the, uh, the CapEx plan real quick, but it was um, maybe that's for the ones that are already, um, already occupied. Maybe it's closer to like 20 a unit. And also you got to remember, so these, you know, it's not a class A property, yeah. right? We're doing uh, RTA cabinets. We're doing, um, we're not doing granite countertops. We're doing black fixtures, LVP floors, um, you know, so we're not doing stuff that's uh, really crazy, but yeah, let me, let me take a peek and see if I can pull this up. Real yeah, but you quick. got sheetrock and you got, yeah, you we got do have rock and, and we did have to do some, 
yeah we had to do electrical too yeah um but yeah it, it was uh it's not as heavy of a lift and you know what really helps too dan is when you're doing all 28 at the same time right your, your crews and your rock and everything you're buying stuff all at the same time you're getting sure. those guys in to knock it all out at the same time so we were really able to negotiate with the contractors a lot better as well we were able to you know just have them help us out with uh with the timing and then also pricing so so what are some other things or what are some things that came up during the due diligence phase that might be interesting to talk about so diligence was pretty straightforward because you know we had um We already had the down units, so that was pretty easy to get mm. done, right? And then it was just making sure that we were going through the uh, the existing units. So I think the most interesting thing about the due diligence process was just everybody knew the owner. He was clearly going and hand collecting these rents. Um, you know, the the units themselves weren't um, weren't really out of sorts. They were as expected. Mm-hmm. He, the most interesting thing was how the guy kept his records. It was literally a yellow notepad. The back of a napkin. <laughs> and I've heard stories of these guys, right? But legitimately, he would write down the rent roll and write down the T12. Like the guy was 80 years old. He didn't have it on an Excel. So we had to compile all that information for the lender. So we'd have to take it, right? And go line by line, rent roll by rent roll, put it all up. And it was, uh, it was, it was pretty amazing. Um, so here, I actually just found my, if you don't mind me, can I share my screen real quick? Um, if you let me share my screen, I'll show you kind of our, you don't don't have to share your screen. Perfect. So yeah, these, uh, the vacant units that we had down, it was 19,950, uh, per unit of the down units was our total costs, right? So three grand for plumbing and electrical rough, four grand for closing up packages, Trim shelving four fifty, LVP eighteen fifty, paint sixteen hundred, appliances twelve hundred, kitchens fifteen hundred, bathrooms twenty five hundred. So, about just under twenty grand um, for per unit costs, and then our total, you know, like I said before, is about one point two million yeah. uh, between interiors and exteriors. So, um, but yeah, that was probably the most interesting. Was the financial due diligence, trying to compile all that stuff for the lender, going through all of the handwritten ledgers and then compiling it into Excel spreadsheets for our lenders. So, mm-hmm. and that's one of the reasons why I have to go to bridge too, because most of your agency lenders or well, your agency lenders won't do that. Fannie and Freddie, they'll, they usually want to see some more concrete financials. Right. But I mean, not to mention 68% occupied, it gets, gets yeah. very. <laughs> yeah, that definitely does. Um, so what about the interior of the, of the existing units? You mentioned also renovating those. What was that kind of target number on that one? So, yeah, we're going to do the same types of packages. Um, and in the existing units, we're at between 10 and 12,000 per unit um, for those existing ones. Okay. And then what's the plan for this one uh, when you sell? What's kind of the exit projection on this, on the sales price on this one? Well, so we have this a, a five year or a seven year hold. So we have it, we underwrite everything to a five year hold, just, okay. um, just kind of how our model works. But for this deal, we got a three year interest only bridge loan mm-hmm. from the lender at 4%. We're about three months in now. We expect to have all of the units uh, that are down up and leased up between March and June. So right around month 18 to 24, we expect to be able to refi out of this bridge and be stabilized. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll, we'll refi out of the bridge, return our investor capital, roll that into another project. And then, I mean, we might hold it for longer because we'll be net positive based on the new valuation and we'll have no equity in the deal, right? So there's that beautiful infinite return that everybody talks about. And- Which I think is actually a misnomer, but- <laughs> in, in what way? Because it's not infinite return because you still, even though you don't have your initial capital in there, you still have capital in it. That if you were to sell the deal and move that capital somewhere else, you could get even big, a, a higher return. Sure. Yeah, it makes sense. It's an, I, uh, it's an infinite return, I guess, on your initial capital, but it's not an, it's not an overall infinite return because you could actually make more money by selling it and moving it into a different asset. 
Right. And like, how long will it take you to make that in cash flow versus selling it and buying a different Correct. asset? Right. So, yeah. Um, but that being said, you know, it's a great area. It's a gentrifying area. It's kind of right on the tip of where uh, everything is changing. There's a brand new class A uh, retail space with uh, supermarkets and a Walmart that just got built in the last six months there. So, Long term, it's a uh, it's a great place to be. So we'll see. I mean, you know, we'll be able to return capital in about twenty four months, and then we'll see where rents go. I mean, since we've bought it, right, and since we underwrote it, we're getting around the nine month mark. We underwrote all of these one bedrooms at seven hundred. The place there's a comp that's uh, literally a couple doors down that's now achieving seven ninety nine rents. Um, that smaller um, smaller one bedroom sizes. So we're already going to be outperforming pro forma numbers based on, you know, what the comps have done in the past year. So good news for us and our investors, but we didn't really see it happening that quickly. So um, we'll play it by year. Like everything else, um, sometimes it makes sense to sell it and cash out and put it into other assets like you just mentioned for higher returns. Sometimes it makes sense if it's easy enough to manage just to hold on to it and let it cash flow. We, mm-hmm. we own... Um, also, you know, the GPLP split on this, you know, we, we own about 70% of this deal ourselves. And that's kind of why we're in the business is for more, um, you know, cash flow, more generational wealth creation, things like that. So I think there's some pops that we definitely want to get in and get out of and other ones that we want to start building our portfolio to hold with. So we'll see. That's a great segue into the next uh, topic here about uh, the structure of the, you know, kind of how you raise the capital and kind of what the structure was for investors and, and various things like that. Yeah. So we, um, so we, from the single family space, most of our investors were getting paid eight to 10% on our flips. Uh, so when we started going to multifamily conferences and listening to podcasts and, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are in private equity uh, in Manhattan. So we kind of understand that structure, the traditional syndication structure with a pref and a waterfall and a split. We don't do that. Um, you know, we, we do a straight pref return. It's uh, a six pref through the uh, cash flow of the deal and a six accrued pref until the exit, whether that's a refi or a sale. So the, um, the split is really the equity post pref split is really between the GP partners, the KP, um, and just kind of internally. So we like that model because our investors get paid first uh, before we get paid. So they make uh, what we consider more consistent returns. Uh, There's definitely a ceiling, so they can't make those big 18 to 22% pops, but there's also a pretty high floor. And uh, a lot of our business model comes from just being anti-volatility. You know, my dad passed away about seven years ago at uh, just the year after the downturn, he lost, maybe 50% of his money in the market and didn't live long enough to ride it back up. So a lot of our um, business model is based on non-volatile. You know, how, do we, how do we create investment opportunities that are not as volatile as the market and even less volatile than kind of traditional real estate investments? And being from the single family market, we've seen big hits and we've seen small hits. And you know, we, we've always paid our investors the same whether we made a lot of money or made no money on those flips. So we just carried that model across to, uh, to the commercial real estate space. So we share uh, 50% of the depreciation and then we have that pref model for the investors. And those are the limited partner investors. And then we're the general partner. So what's the actual equity split of ownership? Is it 50, 50 and you're just, you're giving them the 6% pref um, and then the 6% on the on pop on the back end? Yeah. So there's the equity split. You mean the upside? Well, there's the, you're, you're limiting the upside by limiting it to just the 6% on the upside, but there's got to be an ownership split somewhere yeah, in there for those investors. It, I guess it doesn't really matter what it is as long as it's there. It is 50-50, and that's for uh, the depreciation map too, right? Yeah. So that's how the, um, the property level LLC is, and then the, the managing member LLC is 100% owned by us. And so walk me through what happens during a refinance first. So refinance occurs. Let's talk about this property here. Refi- they've been getting 6%. Are they paid monthly, quarterly? How is that preferred usually paid out? Yep. So it varies per deal. We have both monthly and quarterly payments. On this particular project, There's uh, it's, it's banking. It's accruing right now because as we're turning those down units and, uh, and getting the property to cash flow, it's accruing. So no payments have been made so far. Um, 
And then on a refi, you know, let's call it 24 months if we're correct, then we'll get to 24 months. We'll, we'll catch them up probably starting next quarter on the okay. six pref that's been accrued. And then let's say on month 24, we're able to refi out. We'll give them the other 6% exit and then we'll move that money somewhere else for them. So what I like about that model and what our investors tend to like about that model too, is it's not a five-year hold. Some, some guys like the five years, some, some want a quicker turn just because of velocity of capital. They can compound their money a little bit faster on these two-year holds. Um, and then we can redeploy it for them. Mm-hmm. So, and then after that, they're out of that deal and we stay in, uh, we continue to operate that deal and we move their capital into another project. So technically it's not infinite return for the investors. Like you were talking about earlier, it's infinite return for you. Correct. Right? Cause technically in the, on the refi, you're buying them out and there's paying, buying them out by paying them that getting, catching them up to the 6% preferred if they haven't already been caught up at that point and then giving them another 6% and then cashing them out. Correct. And then just basically moving that into the next investment that's about, that may or may not be available at that time. Right. Okay. Okay. And so at that point, great for you, right? Because now you have this asset, you, you're, you guys own it now 100%, and you guys just continue to cash flow it and, and until you're either ready to sell it or uh, just continue to hold on to it as a wealth generation tool. Yep, exactly. And, you know, we have about a million dollars of our own capital into it. So, you know, that money stays in the deal. It's also not in a pref position like the LPs is. So, you know, we have the most upside for sure. We also have the most exposure. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's interesting. And it's an interesting structure. I haven't, I've, I've seen something similar to that. Um, I think actually uh, Corey Peterson might do something similar to that as well, where he does a 6% pref and then he does 6%. And then uh, the same thing when they do a refi or they or, or a sell, you would get cashed out, and then uh, you know the rest of the upside would be you know given to the the GP ownership. Correct. Yep. Similar. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so one of the other questions I had for you was about the financing. You had mentioned you had three year IO interest only, and you had a four percent. And what were the rest of the terms on that debt? Um. It's a three-year IO balloon. It's four uh, percent, and like I said, it's a first that's seventy percent LTC non-recourse, and then there's a second for the capex budget that is a recourse piece, but same um, same rate, same term. Hmm. That's interesting. So same lender, just two different loans, one, a primary and a secondary. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And what? Uh, are you starting are you, with the, the the drawdown of the construction loan, if you will? I know it's a capex, you know, uh, a draw or whatever. But as you're yeah. doing those renovations, are you only being charged the interest once you draw it down, or are you being charged the interest from the very beginning? Yeah, just uh, on draws. Okay, that's good. Um, so no, that's one thing that you got to be careful of is making sure that you read those loan documents so that you don't start getting, you know, charged the interest on capital that you have not actually received yet. Cause some lenders will do that to you. And that's actually how they make some extra money is they're, you know, investing your money or, you know, making more money off your money until you actually draw it down. So that's yeah. good. And you got to be careful about those reserves too, right. To make sure that you can pay that debt service if you haven't calculated for it. So yeah. Yeah. Great advice. Did they require you to put any kind of COVID reserves in place or anything like that? shockingly, yeah, we have, uh, we have 30 months of interest reserves. Wow. So almost the full boat. Right. And I was shocked about this because I said, and this is, you know, just learning curve for us is, uh, I figured, well, if you're going to take 30 months of reserves, does that mean you're just going to take it from that reserve to pay? And they said, no, (laughs) I said, well, why not? You have all the money, right? We, you can pay the loan for almost the balance of the entire term. Um, but that's not how it works. We'll get it back at refi. (laughs) Oh my goodness. That's crazy. I've, ne- I've, I've heard of uh, probably close to like 18 months, but 30 months, man, that's definitely uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, so just in comparison to where the market is too, though, you know, 82% loan to cost at 4%. When we, when we modeled it against almost any other debt piece that we got, it was fine. I mean, the, the debt service, yeah, we had to raise that capital and we're paying the extra 12% on that money, but it was like, apples and oranges, you know, it still was a huge discrepancy between the next debt piece we got, which I think was closer to 7%. Yeah. Well, you know. hopefully you can now start to charge them 4% for holding on to your reserve money. I'm right? hoping. <laughs> <laughs> it's not usually how that works, but I wish it did because we got, good to be uh, the bank. 
we got millions and millions of dollars in reserves right now. And I wish we could pull it out, but we can't. Yeah, I wish you could at least pay me interest on a something. Exactly. I, want, I hate money that just sits there and does nothing for you. You know, all it's doing is, is a, and you know, the bank's doing something with that money, you know? Well, now you're talking about fractional lending, right? How many times do they get to lend out on those reserves that they're holding seven or 10 times? It's something exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they're making money. Yeah. It's good to be the bank. So how much money did you end up raising on this property? Uh, so it was about a million dollars from outside investors and a million bucks for our, from ourselves or 800,000 from ourselves. Okay. And how long did it take you to raise that, that, uh, 1 million from outside investors? A couple of weeks. It was, it was pretty easy. Um, this one was easy. You know, I, I hate when people say, oh yeah, raising money is easy because it hasn't <laughs> always been easy. Right. I mean, I've even heard you talk about, yeah, well, we send it out to our investors and we're fully raised and that's fantastic. And that's where we're all shooting to go. But the first $4 million was pulling teeth that we had to raise. And that was our first raise. It was a 1193 unit self-storage facility, $4 million. We had just about eight weeks to do it. I had never raised that much money before and we did it, but man, it was a grind and it was hard. And then it's getting easier, right? As, as you uh, build the relationship with your investors and they come to trust the model and they, they know and like you better and it gets easier, but um, that doesn't mean it's always been easy, right? I, I talked to uh, another guy, another mentor of ours, and he's raising a $150 million fund right now. And you know, he was like, oh yeah, we don't do any advertising. We don't do any podcasts. We don't do any of this stuff. You know, money just flows in. And I was like, yeah, but that hasn't, hasn't always been that way. Right. Right. <laughs> so I, I'm grateful that you're saying it's that way now because I can hope to achieve that too. But you know, we've only been raising uh, money for about two, two and a half years. And we've raised about 27 and a half million bucks. And the last couple of raises have been easier and faster, but um, yeah, it's a strategy like everything else, right? You have to be strategic about it. You have to make sure that you're building the relationships. And um, but that one was was pretty easy because it wasn't a huge piece, right? We just uh, the most most recent deal we did was 120 units. It was a four million dollar raise. Um, we did that in about six weeks. You know, and it's a different type of investor, right? I, I don't go to the big conferences with multifamily guys that are looking for their 18 IRRs because of the way that our model is. And our model is different, by the way. You know, I, I know that we're the black sheep kind of of the, uh, of the world when we talk about the model for the LPGP. But the reason that we do it that way as well is, you know, our tagline is invest with purpose. And we carve out um, a equity percentage for in every single deal that we do for a nonprofit. So a lot of our investors are impact investors. They're happy making their 12% because they know that we're giving millions of dollars away to these nonprofits. So we, we carve out a position in every deal that we do to create passive income for the life of the deal for these nonprofits. So we've partnered with about five nonprofits over the last 18 months that'll produce over seven figures for them over the next five years through these deals as well. So um, I, our investors kind of get that ethos. They understand what we're doing through that. And, uh, and they've, they've come on board, you know, excited about some of the stuff that we're able to do to impact the world too. And I wouldn't say you're the black sheep. I mean, I know lots of other people that do something similar to this and it's just different, you know, like everybody yeah. is a little bit different and you know, you're right. Like my investors would not be on board with that at all with that kind of a structure, but your investors sure. are, are with you for a reason and they, they know you, they like you, they trust you. Right. And yeah. it takes time to build that up. But I'll also mention that, you know, it, it has not been this easy for us all the time, right? I mean, I remember yeah. our very first deal, it took us the full 60 days to raise the money. And it was only like a little two and a half million dollars, you know, right? Uh, you know, now we're, we're raising, you know, 20, 20, our largest raise so far was a $21.49 million raise, you know, wow. acquiring a $57.6 million deal. And, you know, it, it, it went pretty quick, you know, yeah. um, but it, it hasn't always been that way. Right. And I think, you know, I, I love to hear that, that level of honesty with stuff, because look, if it was this easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. It does take systems and processes and time and effort and energy and things like that, but it does get easier. And that's, to me, that's the, um, you know, that, that's the driver. That's the hope. That's the motivator is to see that, you know, you just keep at it, right. You keep having conversations, you keep letting people know who you are. You keep talking about your deals and people do start to come back and, they're listening. You know, what I found really interesting over the last couple of years is that people are listening, whether you think they are or not. 
And as you're telling these stories and, you know, yourself on your podcast, but also when you go out and you're at family events or church events or whatever, you know, people are listening, they're watching. And, you know, I just had a guy recently raise his hand and say, Hey, you know, uh, I've been watching what you're doing. I want to learn a little bit more. And, you know, that guy had seven figures to give that he was willing to, uh, to invest in some real estate deals. And I had no idea, right. It was just, it was just consistency and talking about what it is that you do. And, you know, what's uh, that book is uh, getting the money, right. Where she talks about not wearing your superhero outfit, like, you know, tell people who you are, tell people what you do. And eventually that traction starts to gain. And, uh, and then, you know, for guys like yourself that you've built all this trust over time. And now you guys are, you know, sending out your packets to the investors and saying, here's the opportunity and people recognize it as an opportunity. They jump in and they say, yes, I, I don't want to miss out on this opportunity again, because we know that you're consistently providing them, but I want to get in on this one. So it's, uh, it's been very cool to watch your success and, and be able to look at it and say, okay, how can we emulate that? Because it, it is replicable. Yes. So anything else that you can think of on this acquisition that may be interesting for us to talk about that maybe we haven't um, talked about just yet? No, I think, um, I mean, one, we were blessed, right? In a couple of ways, one better debt piece came along through COVID. So, you know, James one, two always says count every struggle as blessing. And this was a struggle. We almost missed out on this deal because all the debt financing fell apart. And then now we're getting two and a half percent better on the debt terms than we originally started because we were persistent. We stayed with it. So, you know, I think that's a big lesson for us was, you know, don't just give up, you know, stay with it, build the relationship, try to stay in, make sure something that you can make something happen. So the debt piece got better. Um, and now the rents, the pro forma rents are almost a hundred bucks better per unit than, than we even projected. Um, and that's just a virtue of the market, right? This is a little bit further outside of the city. You know, cities are kind of having this mass exodus because of COVID. People are trying to live a little bit further outside in the suburbs. Um, so better pro forma opportunity there too. And then CapEx budget was a little bit of a surprise, um, not just with the interior turns, but like, you know, we had to slurry uh, the big potholes in the uh, parking lot because it got too cold too fast. You know, so Columbus, you know, you had to, we, we just didn't account for the fact that, hey, it might be too cold to do the driveway by the time we got it under contract and closed, it was now too cold because, you know, we got the debt piece in July, August, we didn't think it would take till September, October to get things closed and it was too cold. So, you know, we learned a lot of lessons in terms of uh, construction management planning, right? Like maybe wait until the spring to do the, the driveway, which is what we're going to do now, but um, there weren't too many surprises. You know, this was probably one of our cleaner deals. The, uh, it was interesting going through the handwritten notes. It was interesting kind of going back and forth with the seller about some of the terms. And, uh, even when we closed on the deal, you know, he, he, he came with us to collect the first round of rents with a property manager because he didn't tell the tenants yet that he sold. So he walked around and he handed out $25 gift cards, collected the rent and then signed it over to us after closing, which was super strange too. But, you know, we, (laughs) we had the attorneys involved. They said, look, just let the guy do what he's going to do. And we'll make sure it goes into escrow and we'll transfer it (laughs) over. But he like went on his, like his tour to say goodbye and gave these, you know, gift cards to guys. And then, you know, it was, uh, it was an interesting transition to say the least. It wasn't like, you know, established property management company to established property management company where you're doing this clean rollover and, you know, you have to worry about like app folio switching and builder trend switching. It was, you know, here's my yellow, yellow pad and here's a bunch of crinkled up checks. And, you know, so it was, uh, it was an interesting project. I think we're, we're going to crush it in terms of uh, the upside on it and just really excited to, uh, to see the transformation. So. Awesome. Well, I got two final questions for you. They're both contrasting each other. And uh, I ask this to every um, guest that comes on. So first part of the question or first question of the series is, what is one thing that you thought was going to be a lot easier during the process that ended up being a lot harder? Asset management. So for every deal, you know, the biggest kick in the teeth for us was what is the asset management plan? Uh, you know, the property manager executes on the plan, but they don't develop the plan. And that was news to us when we first got started. Our first couple of deals were new construction. So 
new construction was architecturals, engineerings, and GC putting the building up, right? CubeSmart coming in and running those buildings. Um, different than taking over an asset and turning it and saying to the property management team, well, here's what we want to do, right? And then actually having the asset management coalesce with the property management. So what is the plan and what is the timeline and what do you, what are the expectations? Uh, on our first deal, it was kind of like, all right, yeah, go do this first. Okay, go do this. And it was um, very reactionary, right? So now we have to be a lot more proactive. And that was, that was really the biggest aha moment for us was, well, what are you doing in your due diligence uh, timeframe to create that plan, create these spreadsheets, create the construction budget and timeline, and then holding the property management company accountable to executing on that timeline. So that was a big learning curve for us. So that's, that's been very different. So then the final question is the opposite of that. So what did you find that was easier that originally you thought was going to be a little bit more challenging? Finding deals. I thought, you know, I thought that, you know, I, I hear a lot of um, sponsors and sponsorship teams talk about how there's no deals. Um, and maybe it was just kind of understanding that even on the residential side of the business, we we're always told there was no deals, right? The market's terrible. There's no deals. Everybody's after the same foreclosures. The market's great. There's no deals. You know, people are overpaying. Um, well, we built a business in ups and downs, not worrying about what the market said, just trying to figure out how to go and find deals. And um, we have, frankly, more deals than money right now. You know, we have uh, more deal flow than we can take down that fit our parameters. So, you know, we're getting better at the, the capital raising piece of that so that we don't have to turn away deals. But as of right now, um, between the relationships I think that we've built and the markets that we're in and kind of the strategies that we're using to get deals, um, it's, been, it's been working really well. And, you know, finding deals has been easier than I thought. That's great. Well, let's do this. Let's uh, have you share with the audience a little bit about how they can reach out to you if they have further questions about this particular deal, or maybe you want to join on one of your future projects. Yeah. So our website is integrityhg.com. The name of the company is Integrity Holdings Group. And you can check us out on our podcast, uh, Free From Wall Street. So we'd like to talk about getting away from kind of the volatility of the market and talking about some different alternative investments and some different strategies on that podcast as well. So you can reach out to us on any of those social pages or direct on our website and you could sign up for, um, you know, some passive investing one-on-one courses and stuff like that for free on our website as well. Awesome. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing all the information about this particular acquisition. It was an exciting episode. Looking forward to sharing it with our audience and uh, looking forward to having you on a future episode as you continue to close more deals in the new year. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate you. Happy new year to you and your family. Hope you guys are blessed. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.